A Hunger Artist by Franz Kafka During these last decades, the interest in professional fasting has markedly diminished. It used to pay very well to stage such great performances under one's own management, but today that is quite impossible. We live in a different world now. At one time, the whole town took a lively interest in the hunger artist. From day to day of his fast, the excitement mounted. Everybody wanted to see him at least once a day. There were people who bought season tickets for the last few days and sat from morning till night in front of his small barred cage. Even in the nighttime, there were visiting hours, when the whole effect was heightened by torch flares. On fine days, the cage was set out in the open air, and then it was the children's special treat to see the hunger artist. For their elders, he was often just a joke that happened to be in fashion, but the children stood open mouth, holding each other's hands for greater security, marveling at him as he sat there pallid in black tights, with his ribs sticking out so prominently. Not even on a seat, but down among the straw on the ground. Sometimes giving a courteous nod, answering questions with a constrained smile, or perhaps stretching an arm through the bars so that one might feel how thin it was, and then again withdrawing deep into himself, paying no attention to anyone or anything, not even the all-important striking of the clock that was the only piece of furniture in his cage, but merely staring into the vacancy with half-shut eyes, now and then taking a sip from a tiny glass of water to moisten his lips. Besides casual onlookers, there were also relays of permanent watchers selected by the public, usually butchers, strangely enough, and it was their task to watch the hunger artist day and night, three of them at a time in case he should have some secret recourse to nourishment. This was nothing but a formality, instituted to reassure the masses, for the initiates knew well enough that during his fast the artist would never, in any circumstances, not even under forcible compulsion, swallow the smallest morsel of food. The honor of his profession forbade it. Not every watcher, of course, was capable of understanding this. There were often groups of night watchers who were very lax in carrying out their duties and deliberately huddled together in a retired corner to play cards with great absorption, obviously intending to give the hunger artist the chance of a little refreshment, which they supposed he could draw from some private hoard. Nothing annoyed the artist more than such watchers. They made him miserable. They made his fast seem unendurable. Sometimes he mastered his feebleness sufficiently to sing during their watch for as long as he could keep going, to show them how unjust their suspicions were. But that was of little use. They only wondered at his cleverness in being able to fill his mouth even while singing. Much more to his taste were the watchers who sat up close to the bars, who were not content with the dim night lighting of the hall, but focused him in the full glare of the electric pocket torch given to them by the impresero. The harsh light did not trouble him at all. In any case, he could never sleep properly, and he could always drowse a little, even when the hall was thronged with noisy onlookers. He was quite happy at the prospect of spending a sleepless night with such watchers. He was ready to exchange jokes with them, to tell them stories out of his nomadic life, anything at all to keep them awake and demonstrate to them that he had no eatable. Anything at all to keep them awake and demonstrate to them that he had no eatables in his cage, and that he was fasting as not one of them could fast. But his happiest moment was when the morning came and an enormous breakfast was brought them, at his expense, on which they flung themselves, with the keen appetite of healthy men after a weary night of wakefulness. Of course, there were people who argued that this breakfast was an unfair attempt to bribe the watchers, but that was going rather too far, and when they were invited to take on a night's vigil without a breakfast merely for the sake of the cause, they made themselves scarce, although they stuck stubbornly to their suspicions. Such suspicions, anyhow, were a necessary accompaniment to the profession of fasting. No one could possibly watch the hunger artist continuously, day and night, and so no one could produce the first-hand evidence that the fast had really been rigorous and continuous. Only the artist himself could know that, and he was therefore bound to be the sole, completely satisfied spectator of his own fast. Yet, for other reasons, he was never satisfied. It was not perhaps mere fasting that had brought him to such skeleton thinness that many people had regretfully to keep away from his expeditions, because the sight of him was too much for them. Perhaps it was the dissatisfaction with himself that had worn him down, 
for he knew alone that no other initiate knew how easy it was to fast. It was the easiest thing in the world. He made no secret of this, yet people did not believe him. At the best, they set him down as modest. Most of them, however, thought that he was out for publicity, or else he was some kind of a cheat who found it easy to fast because he discovered a way of making it easy, and then had the impudence to admit that fact, more or less. He had put up with all that, and in the course of time had got used to it. But his inner dissatisfaction always rankled, and never yet, after any term of fasting. This must be granted to his credit, had he left the cage of his own free will. The longest period of fasting was fixed by his impresario at forty days. Beyond that term, he was not allowed to go. Not even in great cities, and there was good reason for it too. Experience had proved that for about thirty days, the interest of the public could be stimulated by a steadily increasing pressure of advertisement. But after that, the town began to lose interest. Sympathetic support began notably to fall off. There were, of course, local variations as between one town and the other, but as a general rule, forty days marked the limit. So, on the fortieth day, the flower-bedecked cage was open, enthusiastic spectators filled the hall, a military band played, Two doctors entered the cage to measure the results of the fast, which were announced through a megaphone. And finally, two young ladies appeared, blissful at having been selected for the honor, to help the hunger artist down the few steps leading to a small table, on which was spread a carefully chosen invalid repast. And, at this very moment, the artist always turned stubborn. True, he would entrust his bony arms to the outstretched helping hands of the ladies bending over him, but stand up, he would not. Why stop fasting at this particular moment, after forty days of it? He'd held out for a long time, an illuminably long time. Why stop now, when he was in his best fasting form? Or rather, not yet in his best fasting form. Why should he be cheated out of the fame he would get for fasting longer, for being not only the record hunger artist of all time, which presumably he was already, but for beating his own record by a performance beyond human imagination? since he felt there were no limits to his capacity for fasting. His public pretended to admire him so much, why should it have so little patience with him? If he could endure fasting longer, why shouldn't the public endure it? Besides, he was tired, and now he was supposed to lift himself to his full height and go down to a meal the very thought of which gave him a nausea that only the presence of the ladies kept him from betraying, and even that with an effort? He looked up to the eyes of the ladies who were apparently so friendly and in reality were so cruel and shook his head which felt too heavy of its strengthless neck but then there happened yet again as it always happened the impresario came forward without a word for the band made speech impossible lifted his arms into the air above the artist as if inviting heaven to look down upon its creature here in the straw this suffering martyr, which indeed he was, although in quite another sense, grasped him about the emaciated waist with exaggerated caution so that the frail condition he was in might be appreciated, and committed him to the care of the blenching ladies, not without secretly giving him a shaking so his legs and body tottered and swayed. The artist now submitted completely. His head lolled on his breast as if it had landed there by chance. His body was hollowed out, his legs, in a spasm of self-preservation, clung to each other at the knees, yet scraped on the ground as if it were not really solid ground, as if they were trying to find solid ground. And the whole weight of his body, a featherweight after all, relapsed onto one of the ladies, who, looking around for help and panting a little, this post of honor was not at all what she'd expected it to be, first stretched her neck as far as she could to keep her face at least free from contact with the artist, then, finding this impossible, and her more fortunate companion not coming to her aid but merely extending her own trembling hand, the little bunch of knuckle bones that was the artist, to the great delight of the spectators, burst into tears and had to be replaced by an attendant, who had long been stationed in the readiness. Then came the food, a little of which the impresario managed to get between the artist's lips while he sat in a kind of half-fainting trance to the accompaniment of cheerful patter designed to distract the public's attention from the artist's condition. After that, the toast was drunk to the public, supposedly prompted by a whisper from the artist in the impresario's ear. The band confirmed it with a mighty flourish, the spectators melted away, and no one 
had any cause to be dissatisfied with the proceedings. No one, except the hunger artist himself. He only, as always. So he lived for many years, with small, regular intervals of recuperation, in visible glory, honored by all the world, and yet, in spite of that, troubled in spirit. And all the more troubled because no one would take this trouble seriously. What comfort could he possibly need? What more could he possibly wish for? And if some good-natured person, feeling sorry for him, tried to console him by pointing out that his melancholy was probably caused by fasting, especially when he'd been fasting for some time, that he reacted with an outburst of fury, and to the general alarm began to shake the bars of the cage like a wild animal. Yet the impresario had a way of punishing these outbreaks, which he rather enjoyed putting into the operation. He would apologize publicly for the artist's behavior, which had only to be excused, he admitted, because of the irritability caused by fasting, a condition hardly to be understood by well-fed people. Then, by natural transition, he went on to mention the artist's equally incomprehensible boast that he could fast for much longer than he was doing. He praised the high ambition, the good will, the great self-denial undoubtedly implicit in such a statement, and then quite simply countered it by bringing out photographs, which were also on sale to the public, showing the artist on the fortieth day of fasting, lying in bed, almost dead from exhaustion. This perversion of the truth, familiar to the artist though it was, always unnerved him afresh and proved too much for him. What was a consequence of the premature ending of his fast was here presented as the cause of it. To fight against this lack of understanding, against a whole world of non-understanding, was impossible. Time and time again, in good faith, he stood by the bars listening to the impresario. But as soon as the photographs appeared, he always let go and sank with a groan back onto the straw, and the reassured public could once more come close and gaze at him. A few years later, when the witnesses of such scenes called them to mind, they often failed to understand themselves at all. For, meanwhile, the aforementioned chance and public interest had set in. It seemed to happen almost overnight. There may have been profound causes for it, but who was going to bother about that? At any rate, the pampered hunger artist suddenly found himself deserted one fine day by the amusement seekers who went streaming past him to more favorite attractions. For the last time, the impresario hurried him over half Europe to discover whether the old interest might still survive there and here. All in vain. Everywhere, as if by secret agreement, a positive revulsion from professional fasting was in evidence. Of course, it could not really have sprung up so suddenly as all that, and many promontory symptoms which had not been sufficiently remarked or suppressed during the rush and the glitter of success now came retrospectively to mind. But it was now too late to take any countermeasures. Fasting would surely come into fashion again at some future date, yet that was no comfort for those living in the present. What, then, was a hunger artist to do? He had been applauded by thousands in his time and could hardly come down to showing himself in a street booth at village fairs. And as for adopting another profession, he was not only too old for that, but too fanatically devoted to fasting. So. He took leave of the impresario, his partner in an unparalleled career, and hired himself to a large circus. In order to spare his own feelings, he avoided reading the conditions of his contract. A large circus, with its enormous traffic in replacing and recruiting men, animals, and apparatus, can always find a use for people at any time, even for a hunger artist, provided, of course, that he does not ask too much. And in this and, in this particular case anyhow, it was not only the artist who was taken on, but his famous and long-known name as well. Indeed, considering the particular nature of his performance, which was not impaired by advancing age, it could not be objected that there was an artist past his prime, no longer at the height of his professional skill, seeking a refuge in some quiet corner at a circus. On the contrary, the hunger artist averred that he could fast as well as ever, which was entirely credible. He even alleged that if he were allowed to fast as he liked, and this at once was promised to him without more ado, he could astound the world by establishing a record never yet achieved, a statement which certainly provoked a smile among the other professionals, since it was left out of account the change in public opinion, which the hunger artist in his zeal conveniently forgot. He had not, however, actually lost his sense of the real situation, 
and took it as a matter of course that he and his cage should be stationed, not in the middle of the ring as a main attraction, but outside, near the animal cages, on a site that was, after all, easily accessible. Large and gaily painted placards made a frame for the cage and announced what was to be seen inside it. When the public came thronging out in the interval to see the animals, they could hardly avoid passing the hunger artist's cage and stopping there a moment. Perhaps they might even have stayed longer, had not those pressing behind them in the narrow gangway, who did not understand why they should be held up in their way towards the excitements of the menagerie, made it impossible for anyone to stand gazing quietly for any length of time. And that was the reason why the hunger artist, who had of course been looking forward to these visiting hours as the main achievement of his life, began instead to shrink from them. At first, he could hardly wait for the intervals. It was exhilarating to watch the crowds come streaming his way until, only too soon, not even the most obstinate self-deception, clung to almost consciously, could hold out against the fact. The conviction was borne in upon him that these people, most of them, to judge from their actions again and again without exception, were all on their way to the menagerie. And the first sight of them from the distance remained the best, for when they reached his cage, he was once again deafened by the storm of shouting and abuse that rose from those two contending factions, which renewed themselves continuously. Of those who wanted to stop and stare at him, he soon began to dislike them more than the others, not out of any real interest, but out of an obstinate self-assertiveness, and those who wanted to go straight on to the animals. When the first great rush was passed, the stragglers came along, and these, whom nothing could have prevented from stopping to look at him as long as they had breath, raced past with long strides, hardly even glancing at him in their haste to get to the menagerie in time. And all too rarely did it happen that he had a stroke of luck, when some father of a family fetched up before him with his children, pointed a finger at the hunger artist and explained at length what the phenomenon meant, telling stories of earlier years when he himself had watched similar but much more thrilling performances, and the children, still rather uncomprehending, since neither inside nor outside school had they been sufficiently prepared for this lesson, what did they care about fasting, yet showed by the brightness of their intent eyes that new and better times might be coming. Perhaps, said the hunger artist to himself many a time, things could be a little better if his cage were not so quite near the menagerie. That made it too easy for people to make their choice, to say nothing of what he suffered from the stench of the menagerie. The animal's restlessness by night, the carrying past of raw lumps of flesh for the beasts of prey, the roaring at feeding times, which depressed him continuously. But he did not dare to lodge a complaint with the management. After all, he had the animals to thank for the troops of people who passed his cage, among whom there might always be one here and there to take an interest in him. And who could tell where they might seclude him if he called attention to his existence, and thereby to the fact that, strictly speaking, he was only an impediment on the walk to the menagerie. A small impediment, to be sure, and one that grew steadily less. People grew familiar with the strange idea, and they could be expected, in times like these, to take an interest in the hunger artist, and with this familiarity the verdict went out against him. He might fast as much as he could, and he did so, but nothing could save him now people passed by him. Just try to explain to anyone the art of fasting. Anyone who has no feeling for it cannot be made to understand it. The fine placards grew dirty and illegible. They were torn down. The little notice board telling the number of fast days achieved, which at first was changed carefully every day, had long stayed at the same figure, for after the first few weeks, even this small task seemed pointless to the staff and so the artist simply fasted, on and on, as he had once dreamed of doing. And it was no trouble for him, just as he had always foretold. But no one counted the days, not one. Not even the artist himself knew what records he was already breaking. And his heart grew heavy, and when once, in a time, some leisurely passerby stopped, made merry over the old figure on the board and spoke of swindling, that was, in its way, the stupidest lie ever invented by indifference and borne by malice since it was not the hunger artist who was cheating. He was working honestly, but it was the world that was cheating him of his reward. Many more days went by, however, and that too came to an end. The overseer's eye fell on the cage one day, and he asked the attendants why this perfectly good cage should be left standing there, unused, with dirty straw inside it. 
Nobody knew until one man, helped out by the notice board, remembered about the hunger artist. They poked him to the straw with sticks and found him still in it. Are you still fasting? said the overseer. When on earth do you mean to stop? Forgive me, everybody, whispered the hunger artist. Only the overseer, who had his ear to the bars, understood him. Of course, said the overseer, and tapped his forehead with a finger to let the attendants know what state the man was in. We forgive you. I always wanted you to admire my fasting, said the hunger artist. We do admire it, said the overseer affably. But you shouldn't admire it, said the hunger artist. Well, then we don't admire it, said the overseer. But why shouldn't we admire it? Because I have to fast. I can't help it, said the hunger artist. What a fellow you are, said the overseer. And why can't you help it? Because, said the hunger artist, lifting his head a little and speaking, with his lips pursed as if for a kiss right into the overseer's ear, so that no syllable might be lost. Because I couldn't find the food if I liked. And if I had found it, believe me, I should have made no fuss and stuffed myself like you or anyone else. These were his last words. But in his dimming eyes remained the firm, though no longer proud, persuasion that he was continuing to fast. Well, clear this out now said the overseer, and they buried the hunger artist, straw and all. Into the cage they put a fine young panther. Even the most insensitive felt it refreshing to see this wild creature leaping around the cage that had so long been dreary. The panther was all right. The food he liked was brought to him without hesitation by the attendants. He seemed not even to miss his freedom. His noble body, furnished almost to the bursting point with all that it needed, seemed to carry freedom around with it too. Somewhere in his jaws it seemed to lurk, and the joy of life streamed with such ardent passion from his throat that, for the onlookers, it was not easy to stand the shock of it. But they braced themselves, crowded around the cage, and did not ever move away.